Okay. Uh, if you've got a Bible, if you'd like to follow me in your Bible, or just, you know, just listen or whatever, if you want to find Colossians, I want to uh, read some, some of the things that Paul wrote here. Colossians, if you can find that, too. just turn over in chapter 1. Okay, Colossians chapter 1. Let's just look at verse 26. And uh, this is a passage that most of us are probably real familiar with, if not one that we should be or could, could be very familiar with. Verse 26 says, Even the mystery... And we find that when we read Paul's writing, we're going to find that word mystery costly from the word mysterion. It's, it's a constant thing. Constant theme. It's not so much a theme in the Old Testament. Sometimes in the Old Testament we have the secret or whatever. And so many times you look at a mystery as a secret, in which that's kind of true whatsoever. But there was a mindset that belonged to the peoples about 1,700 years ago that don't belong to most people today. And we pretty much lost that mindset. And that mindset was a very redemptive mindset. And it was taught to all cultures, all nations, literally all around the world. And uh, so, so that's why we see these, this theme or this word. We see it li listed a lot in Paul's writings, mystery. And again, in the Old Testament, you'll see the word secret or will the things of God. And that generally the things of God is what's referred to as the mystery or the secret. And when you see it, as you see it, it's not a mystery anymore. It is not a secret anymore. Why? Because you see it. And the more we own that, we begin to own the mystery and we own the secret. Then it becomes life. It becomes normal life. So we start to live out of that. And that living out of that begins to be advantageous to it. It enhances us. It strengthens us. And it may not instantly change us, but it will work in that progression. And that's that's the goal. So, Okay, so anyway, uh, making more out of that word mystery or secret or whatever probably would be an error. It, it should be normal, but because of, of the uh, indoctrination that we have all undergone for 1700 years. Indoctrination just simply means this is how I believe. And uh, and everybody has that, I believe, opinion. And I, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that many of what I believe don't serve. So even the mystery which has been hidden is from ages and from generations, but now, look at that word, but now made manifest to his saints. The saints would just simply be people who are initiated into the mystery. And initiation into the mystery starts out with the ideology of baptized or submersed in a revelation. That's not so much as totally dumped in water because you are a total water vessel. So that mystery is already completely dumped inside you. And you are the living breathing, walking, talking mystery. And so we, we, the, the saints are those who have begun this path of initiation. The path of initiation starts with the opening of your mind. You begin to open your mind. Verse 27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the nations, the Gentiles, so we don't get lost on it. Nations, in other words, all peoples. All peoples all over the world, cultures, Skin colors, hair texture, <laughs> it just does not matter, okay? All peoples. Uh, which is this mystery among all the nations, which is. Now, Paul's writing as a Greek. Y'all know that, don't you? You know, most church folks should know that. Paul wrote Greek. Paul, but, it, you know, he was uh, educated in Hebrew, but he wrote in Greek. So you could say he was multilingual, or you could say that he understood the language of two different cultures, Greek and Hebrew. But you go even further than that in the life of Paul, you find that Paul studied excessively in the Alexandrian library. And so then that means that he was very exposed to Egyptian mythology. 
And not only that, probably mythologies from all over the world because the Alexandrian Library was known to have a collection of all of the ancient wisdoms from all around the world, which would include Mayan cultures, which would inc include the cultures in South America and Peru, up in Puma Puka and the temples and the things down in that area, as well as Buddhist, Japanese, Shinto, you name it, Hindu. So, you know, the Alexandrian Library was a library of all cultures, not to, ex not to extract one from the other, but all cultures and all of the ideologies which were the same, but used different stories to tell the same thing. And the same thing was the mystery. So if I'm speaking in Hindu and I talk about the mystery of the Hindu, the Atma, the God in me, I may use a different terminology. But it's just like if I spoke Spanish and I said, here, Kirby, is you an apple? Or I spoke English, I would say, here, Kirby, here's you an apple. I don't know how to say it in Spanish. But if I could say it in Spanish, I would. Or if I could say it in uh, Chinese, I would. But I'm saying the same thing, I want to give you an apple. So we have these different languages that are barriers, it should be barriers, which say the different thing. It's just like if I said, well, turn on the light. In English, that's what I would say. For the word light, I'd use the word light. Well, if I was in Greek, I would use the word false or phosphorus to turn the light on. If I was using Latin, I would use the word Lucifer, turn the light on, turn Lucifer on. <laughs> well, you see, we have a tremendous problem with language barriers because we have religious ideologies that built doctrines and beliefs around words. And that's not necessarily right or wrong, it's just how they were interpreted to us and how we received them. Y'all understand? understand what I'm saying, right? Yeah. Amen. So here we said, look at verse 27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of and the glory of the glory of this mystery among the nations, which is Christ in you. Now what did we do? Or what did the Roman church do with that word, that Greek word? which that Greek word actually is Christos. What did the Roman church do with that word? Well, you, you're scratching your head. What the Roman church did with that word Christ, which is from the Greek Christos, which actually means anointing or oil, gave it as one of Jesus' names, just like my name, Harry L. Lynn. So I, you know, that, so what we did is we associate Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ as one of the, one of the uh, names of the character. Even though when you get a little more advanced in religion, you kind of use it as Christ Jesus would be like saying Mr. Jesus or we're giving it a certain higher designation. But that's not the name of Jesus. It's not the name of any literal historical person, period. It's, it's the Greek word Christos. If I use the Hebrew designation of this oil, I would say Mashiach. And if I used an Egyptian designation of this same word, I would use a different word. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So we have words that are communicating certain concepts and ideas that many times we've lost the concept. And, and Christ is the biggest one. That's the biggest one. Because... Most of the time, when you find the word Jesus in Pauline's epistles, it's added by the translators. Because Paul never talks about Jesus. People out here, people say, oh, yeah, he did. He had an experience on the road to Damascus. I tell you what, hold your finger right here in Colossians. We're going to come right back over here. Let's just quickly, I think that would be about Acts 9 or 10. Just flip over there and see if you can find that real quickly. Yeah, yeah, Acts 9, Acts chapter 9, and we'll go right back over to Colossians. Acts chapter 9, we'll see what, we'll see what happens here. And of course, you're dealing with Acts, the book of Acts is, is really suspicious as to uh, who, the trans, who was the author of the book of Acts. Many people, if not most scholars, give the author to the book of Acts at least the first half of the book, to Luke. And you know what most people think? Luke was one of the apostles of Jesus. And that is, that's ridiculous. Luke was a Greek doctor. 
And if Luke was a Greek doctor, there's not any question in my, in my mind, if there was a literal Luke, he understood all Greek mythology. Because in Greek mythology, you had all kinds of names. Matter of fact, there's probably as many as 50 different designations of names from the Greek mythologies for different things. And so, Christ actually being one of those designations in Greek mythology. So Paul writes as a Greek. Luke wrote as a Greek if there were a ca character named Luke. So it's not written in Hebrew. Okay? Verse 3. Acts chapter 9 verse 3. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly there shined. Everybody say shine. 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 That's not moonshine. <laughs> That's uh, other kinds of shine. It's more like sunshine. There shine round about him light. Now what Paul's experience with? Light. He has an experience with light. And you know what they do with this? They paint you pictures of this light in the person of what we have named Jesus at, with an aura emanating around him. And that was Jesus appeared. It doesn't say that. It says a light appeared to Paul. And this light was so bright that this light supposedly dimmed him or blinded his natural eye. Actually, it gave him an ability to see in the spiritual realm. And you know what? Every one of us have had this, maybe not as, as intense as this, and maybe so. We've all had these moments where we receive the light or a revelation or, let me give you another word for this, an experience. Good. Phenomenal experience. And then what we do with that experience, we give it a name. So whatever the religious persuasion you have, you will name your experience to the character of your religious experience. Ex, uh, your religious persuasion and so now no matter who you are or what you think your experience has the name of a personality it ain't right or wrong it just is and it's a bless God I ain't going to deny my experience you shouldn't because your experience is a part of the beginning of your transformation so whatever designation you want to give it as a name is totally irrelevant you know really hone in on the experience because see I had that experience in my mid-twenties and I didn't give it the designation of a name I just knew that I was experiencing something I called it God I called it the Father I, I didn't know to call that experience Jesus because I wasn't religiously taught that at that point in time in my life but I knew I was going through something phenomenal and so <laughs> It had a lot of what I was going through in my experience had a lot of delivering power. And I knew that. I knew that, uh, I mean, I didn't, I wasn't doing goosebumps. I wasn't running and speaking in tongues and all that. I just was going through phenomenal changes as a result of this, this light, this same thing, this experience, road, my, road, my Damascus Road experience. So Paul's Damascus Road experience was with the light. And you know what Paul named that light? Christ. And he talks constantly. If you read the Pauline epistles, you're going to see the most predominant word in his epistles is Christ in you. Now, there ain't no other person living inside you, but you. You live inside you, right? And the essence of what God is lives inside you. But every one of us, because of religious persuasions, we've taught ourselves to name that a person or whatever. And that's based off your religious persuasion or your religious ideas or the culture you're raised in. And that's neither right or wrong. It's just an experience. So I hope that that makes sense to you. So come back over with me and I want you to see what Paul's saying here in Colossians. And then I want to read some things I, I wrote to you uh, here in just a minute. So Colossians chapter 1, look at again at verse 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so uh, it's not hard to see that. Let me, I, was just, I was just thinking of another passage uh, that... Uh, I thought I might read 
news to you. You don't have to turn over there. And here's another. This is just a verse. I want to read this verse to you. It's out of Galatians 1.15. You don't have to turn over there. Just to stay with Colossians. It says, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace to reveal His or God's Son in me. Not to me. In me. What is God revealing? God's revealing, if you're looking at Greek mythology, God's revealing Christ in you. Why? Because Christ in you is an unction, an oil, an anointing that you have. Again, if you're Hebrew, that oil in you is Mashiach. Then God's revealing Mashiach in you. Again, if you're Egyptian, God's revealing another in you. But it's the same no matter how you designate it to a historical character. It's not a historical character. It's something that's working inside you. And that's working in you right here and right now. So Colossians again, he says it's Christ in you. That's right, he's revealing his son in me. Not to me, but in me. And his son is a reflection or an emanation of itself. God, i.e. the energy, the source. Now look at chapter 2. I'm going to read this to you. Chapter 2, Colossians verse 1 says, For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. In, you see the word in King James, it's the word whom. And when you have the word whom, you're looking at a designation of a person. Because you always think of whom as an individual. But the Greek word right here is not the word for whom. Actually, it's the word in which. Or you could say it's the word in what. So you'd be surprised at these little bitty words that are twisted and changed to make a point trying to get a historical character. And this ain't talking about a historical character. It says, in which are hid all of the treasures. What is that? That which, that what? That's the oil, that's the him, that's the God, that's the presence that's inside your very being. And you didn't invite it there, you didn't ask it to come there, you were born with it there. Hallelujah. You as the temple, you as the house, you and I are the very construction of God itself. God built you nothing and nobody else did. We, our, your mama didn't have the ingenuity nor the technology to put you together through her thoughts in her womb. It was done without her even thinking. It was done without the sound of hammers and saws. It was done by God itself, by spirit. Spirit built you. You're the product of that. So he says the, uh, the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ in which are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You see, knowledge is an outcropping of wisdom. Wisdom, when you there's three different aspects of wisdom, and one of those aspects is logistics. And logistics just simply means the ability for you and me to think commonly through any situation. And you know in Christianity, they want you to throw that out completely. They don't even want you to think. They want you to just believe. Only believe. <laughs> Just believe what I'm telling you to be the truth. <laughs> and uh, you know what? They have passed that on through innocent, ignorant persons. I was the recipient of that myself in my early years. But I'm asking all these questions. If I hadn't been asking all these questions, I would have just went right on down the road just regurgitating what they told me. What to believe, what to think, how to think. So, I want to read you. Let me read you some things here that I wrote uh, quite a bit. Matter of fact, it says, The central theme of all religion and all nations all over the realm that we call the earth was the fabulous story or myth of a dying and a resurrecting God-man. And, of course, you, you're... Uh, hearing and thinking on the lines of something that I've been on now for the last quite a few weeks, and that is the death and resurrection. What in the world is the death and the resurrection? And of course, in Christianity, it's all focalized and centralized on one historical character, which we know of as Jesus. 
And that's it. That's the limitation of the death and resurrection. But every culture, every nation on the face of the earth had a dying and resurrecting God-man in their culture and in, uh, in their ideologies. So what's the difference in ours as Christians embracing the idea of Jesus' death and resurrection and theirs? The difference is all other nations around the world did not make their dying and resurrecting God-man a historical figure. That's basically the, the biggest difference. So you and me, we put the power that should belong to us from this death-resurrection thing, we put that power that should belong to us on our historical character of 2,000 years ago, and now we're waiting on him to come back to, uh, to finally uh, cap off or finalize or raise my body up from the grave so that I have this power and this experience. So that's, that's a lot of the difference. Yes, you're shirking your responsibility of who you are from that. We it do. We turn into nothing. We do, but we don't mean to. We no, do no, it. No, no, we no, all no. do it innocently. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And so it's time now that innocence is not going to serve you any longer. It's like it's time now that we grow up out of the nursery and start to begin to rise up into the head that we are supposed to be. And so that's happening for all of us. All of us, just like in your sharing and the way he's talking about. The moment you begin to really get free from things that are binding you is when we can vocal them, vocalize them out in a group or in a crowd. I'm not ashamed of it no more. So now that I'm owning it, I'm freeing myself from it. That's, that's a really a positive thing, okay? So, these all cultures have a dying and a resurrecting God men. Yet, for the masses of the majority of Christianity after 326 and the Nicene Creed, the central theme of a dying and resurrecting God man got localized and literalized and historicalized in a single character called Jesus. Yet for thousands and thousands of years, this myth or story of a dying and resurrecting God man had been told by all nations all over the earth. This typical figure, typical or typical, Typical is my better word, type, because it's a type, an allegory. This typical figure, in other words, and I'll give you the names of some. Horus, and you can listen to these names. Horus with the U.S. at the end of it. Bacchus with the U.S. Dionysus with the U.S. Osiris with the U.S. Hercules with the U.S. in the middle of it. And the list, is, the list just goes on and on and on. I, I may have wrote down some more here. I think I did. I'll get to them when I read some more. But this list just goes on and on and on. Uh, and also, Jesus, with a U.S. in it, uh, well, as Jesus, was to show, was to show us with a U.S. in it. <laughs> in other words, all of us, humanity, all of humanity, our own innate divinity. So if I'm talking about Horus from Egyptian mythology, or if I'm talking about Dionysus from Greek mythology, <coughs> am I talking about my own innate divinity? Yes, that's what the stories were all about. So our, it's about our own godhood, our own potential. Let me use that word potential because everybody has the Godhood potentially. In, in other words, it's like it's dormant there. And a part of this resurrection story is raising that Godhood up in me, in my being. So it says our own innate divinity and potential Godhood. This divinity, <coughs> excuse me, this divinity <coughs> or Godhood is to be cultivated and developed by each and every individual as a part of our own growth from infancy to maturity. This term Christ is a Greek designation. <coughs> I, got that, I got that fly in my throat. Uh, Oh, excuse me, y'all. 
This term Christ is a Greek designation from the Greek Christos, and that word in, in Strong's Concordance 5547 comes from the root 5548, which is Cairo. Christos comes from Cairo. And the word Cairo just simply means to consecrate or to contact with oil. So the word Christos means anointing oil. Not a name of, it's not a name of a person. Okay? Paul did not write in Hebrew, but in Greek. Thus we have the Old Testament, which is the foundation of everything in the New Testament. So you have the Hebrew, which actually is the foundation, <coughs> the root, which Jesus said, if you're going to build a house, you have to build it from the foundation up. And if you don't have it on a solid rock or a solid ground, I was talking to a guy from uh, California this past week. He called me, talking to me about one of the monthly CD. And he was asking me about knowledge. And what he was saying about knowledge, he was talking about how that we don't need knowledge. We just really need to shun the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and stay away from that. And I, I just had to stop. I said, let me ask you a question. I said, does Hosea say we perish for the lack of knowledge? Yeah. I said, does Isaiah say that we go into destruction or we go into captivity because of the lack of knowledge? Yeah. I said, then why in the world you want to shun the tree of knowledge in Genesis chapter 2? I said, what happens is we have been religiously brainwashed of Genesis chapter 2 from misquotes, mistranslations, and other things. I said, the book of Proverbs says, with everything you get, get knowledge. I said, knowledge is the foundation of wisdom. Without knowledge, you're not going to have the wisdom that you need. And so the very thing that we lack, we stay away from when that's the very thing we should be pursuing. And that's knowledge. Because Jesus said, the root of knowledge is gnosis, knowing. What does knowing it has to do when Adam knew his wife? In other words, it has to do with intimacy. When I become intimate with the divine, with the spirit, I get imparted to me the wisdom of that or the knowledge of that to my very being. So I, that's what we, we need that. Desperately do we need that. Knowledge. And knowledge generally is, takes or requires labor. <laughs> when you say labor, everybody says, I don't want to do that. <laughs> that that sounds like work to me. <laughs> Well, that's what Paul said, work out your salvation. Yours, it belongs to you, barely it's yours. It ain't Kirby's, he's working on his own. I'm working on mine, right? Mm -hmm. That's good preaching, Brother Lee, and I appreciate Amen. it. <laughs> I'm working on my salvation. I'm working on me. And so I have to take responsibility for me. I can't take responsibility for nobody. I love you all that. I love my kids, I love my grandkids, and I sometimes have to bite my tongue. Because I said, bless God, y'all ought not be doing that. Y'all need to be down here doing this. Now, by my tongue, why? Because everybody's on their own path. It's their individual journey. And there are many times in every moment of every day, every one of us reaches a point somewhere in that day where we could renew our journey. If that's how the days are set up. God set them up that way. We mostly ignore those times. We just slip around past them. Because, hey, sometimes they're very, very faint, and sometimes they're just, they're here for a moment and they're gone. But nevertheless, they're constantly there. God will never leave us and never forsake us, constantly pricking us, constantly drawing us into itself. So, the Hebrew, actually, the glimpse of, the, of the, our holy characters are the foundation for the New Testament writings by the Apostle Paul. In other words, the Greek term Christos is not the designation of a personal name, such as James, that's the name, or John, or Brian, or Danny, or Sue, or Mary, or Martha. Those are names. Those are names. But Christ is not a name. It's not a designation of a person's name, like most of us have been taught. Nor is it Jesus' personal name. It is a term like many of the names or terms to speak of the human body or God's temple or house or dwelling place in the physical, natural world. There are many other Greek terms that we have, that we have all heard that are names 
that are named but not referring to literal, physical human beings, such as Ascalipius, us, U.S., got to hear, Ascalipius, which actually is the god of medicine. In Greek mythology, when you want to get health or you were looking for uh, health or medicine from sickness, you would refer to the god Ascalipius. Or Ceres, you've all heard of that, which is a designation for the constellation Taurus. You can hear all these husses in there. I hope you hear. I hope you can hear. Because there are there are probably fifty or hundred or more that have that are spelled without the US in them. But there are probably as many as 20, 30 or more that have this us in them for different reasons. I don't know what the reasons are. So Cirrus, which is another designation for the constellation of Taurus. Dionysus, which is the god of winemaking. Dionysus, the Greek god, was the merry god. He was happy, so if you want to get happy, go Dionysus. Why? He's the god of wine. Merry heart doeth good like medicine. So, that, so who were they seeking? They were seeking Dionysus. Well, they weren't looking for some man. Name that. But they were looking for an energy, something that's already inside you. See, there's an energy inside you that can make you drunk without even taking on alcoholic beverages. And that energy, I don't know if you've ever, I've experienced that many times in Christian services or in worship. I've been drunk on, on the Spirit in worship service. Sometimes I couldn't even talk. Sometimes I get drunk in the Spirit preaching and I feel like I'm staggering almost or not and not and not. So that would be, if, if I was going to do that in Greek mythology, I would be experiencing Dionysus. Hallelujah. Dionysus woke me up a bottle of some really good wine. See, these are all dying and resurrecting God men that I'm telling you about. Uh, Helios, and here instead of having the U.S., they have an O.S., so they change the vowels, A-E-I-O-U, in these different names. Helios, and you know, y'all can hear the term Helios. You know who that Greek God represents, don't you? Heli? Son. Helios was the god of the sun. So when you try and get your crop, then you're going to consult the god Helios to nourish your crop and to grow your crop and to strengthen your crop. So that was the god of the sun. Then you got Hermes. Then you got Morpheus. Morpheus, y'all, how many of you seen uh, The Matrix? Now, I mean, everybody, should, everybody in the whole world should have at least seen The Matrix, especially the first one, if not the whole series. Y'all done all seen. Well, you remember Morpheus? Well, who is Morpheus? Morpheus is the god of the dream, didn't he? Uh, what was he going to take him? He said, you got two pills. You can take the red one or the blue one, right? And what happens? You go into this dream state. So that, that, whole, that whole movie series is based off mythology, phenomenal mythology. It, it includes Greek mythology. It includes Hebrew. It includes Christian. It includes Egyptian. All of that is in that movie. It, you can go back. If you hadn't watched it, watch it again. That's a tremendous, tremendous movie. Uh, Helios, Hermes, Morpheus, Prometheus. Y'all familiar with these names, aren't you? I, I mean, the list, I, I went on one side to try to get the list, and I found over 50 on this one side. Just Greek. Just Greek gods. Greek dying and resurrecting God. I mean, that, and that's all I did was just trying to find God dying and resurrecting God. I mean, Morpheus, the, he's the god of dreams. Prometheus, he's the god that molded mankind out of clay. Wow, now I sound like I seem like I heard a story about that somewhere. I wonder where I got that. That was in uh, these stories I'm talking about have been in Greek mythology for thousands of years before the story of Christians, Jesus. So Prometheus, he was the god who molded mankind out of clay. Zeus. And that's not the great name that my grandson owned. His name was Zeus because he was, he was mighty. Zeus was the god of the sky, and there are many, many more with these U.S., O.S., E.S. name designations. The list just goes into hundreds of God-man characters. When we encompass all nations and all of the characters, they never refer to a literal, historical man, not one of them. 
every one of them referring to a God-man character, dying and resurrecting God-man character. But why so many and why so much confusion? The confusion was, was a creature of Constantine and his council of Nicaea in 326 and his formation of the Roman church better known as the Catholic church. All of these and hundreds more were called God-men characters who must die and raise again. And then I wanted to read you something from Kuhn. All of these characters have to die and they have to resurrect again. And that's where, that's where there's a lot of confusion. What does that mean, that term mean die or be dead? And that's where so much confusion is at. Uh, let me read you this. It says, how then we will be challenged. Let me see if I got that right. How then we will be challenged. Can it be declared that the central doctrine of all sacred writings of old, the death and the resurrection of divinity, refers to that very part of man which cannot die? How many of you know that there's a part of you that will never die? Yep. You're going to lay your physical body down, but there's a part of you that will never, and it can't. That's the real part of you. That's the real you. The physical flesh, this one that we wear and that we carry around in this dimension is not the real you. It wants to be, but it ain't. It tries to dominate the real you. It tries to subserve, become the master of your house. It does a pretty good job. Yeah. Mine does a real good job. Mm -hmm. But it ain't the real you. And it's not the master of your house. Hallelujah. Paul says it this way in Galatians chapter 2. He said, well, let's just flip over there real quickly and read that. Just, you're right here close to it. Just go backwards a couple of pages. Philippians chapter 4. I said chapter 2. Philippians chapter 4. Just look at this real quickly. Verse 1, Philippians 4, 1 says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be the Lord of everything, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. The elements of the world is another term for the evil of the world. The elements of the world is where we get the idea of evil. Simply because that element and that evil force can run havoc to your physical body unless you know what to do about it or do to it. It says, verse 4, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now that Son that God sent forth was God's Spirit, or that emanation of God, or that seed of God or that germ of God itself which was hear this not the name of a historical man but was the spark of the light of what God is so God sent off a, a little flicker of his own light into you and that flicker of his own light is the light that's inside you mm. so that what, what happens that's the part that we want to feed. That's the part that's in us that's like a dying God-man. And what does that part need? Resurrection. That part that's within us is that part that's under this, what we would call stupor of the flesh. So he says, uh, death and resurrection refers to that very part which cannot die, which is the spirit slash soul of you. It is a legitimate challenge, but it can be met. The divine soul sent by the Father to earth to inhabit a mortal body can never die in the sense of total extinction or loss of being, else it could not return to its heavenly home after its term in life in the body. But there is a form of death, rather a state of deadness, a, a partial or semi-death, a torpidity, an inertness, a slumber, a coma, a veiling of full consciousness which the soul was said to undergo when it first took residence in the earthly body. Now, that to me is probably about as profound of a statement as could be made. And it's so, so many times it's difficult for us to see it. It's difficult for us to hear it. 
But if we can, and if we do hear that, then we begin to realize what I want to awaken in me is a divine soul, is to awaken my spirit slash soul. So let me read you another statement here from a little book. So much, so much. <laughs> the legend of a descent of the deific power to an underworld and its wrestling there to overcome the forces of the elements slash evil is almost universally present in the religions of all of the world. It is significant that this descent usually followed upon the hero's decease on earth. In this netherworld, the dead were believed to be detained until they were awakened, reanimated, liberated, led forth to regain an upper world of light and air through the sacrificial agency of the hero god or other divine emissary. Death itself was personified, likewise Hades, as powers holding souls in captivity so that the Son of God was to break their hold on the dead to set the prisoners free. So if you can hear it, and you know sometimes you got to just hear it over and over and over until you finally let it break through our conscious and then into our subconscious and there make that transformation power in our subconscious that what I'm awakening is the spirit soul inside me. The spirit soul is that part that needs to be nourished and fed. And you see, the spirit soul don't live on fried chicken like me. I mean, it don't live on these really wonderful gourmet foods like the main meal of the spirit soul is silence and breath. And those things that it longs for, silence and breath, are the things I starve it from. Don't we? <laughs> I do. I can't find time to be quiet. And yet my soul, my spirit, my dying and resurrecting God man inside me is longing for that. Is constantly crying for that. Is constantly calling out to me, Lynn, come over here and be quiet. Come over here and listen. Come over here and shut it down. Because all that noise in your brain, all that stuff you call going on in your mind is not serving you. It's not nourishing you. Amen. 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 Preach it, brother Lynn. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? What, yes. And that's the very thing that we shun. And that's the very nourishment that the spirit slash soul needs in order to raise from its stupor or in order to raise from its comatose state. Why is it comatose? Mainly because I've starved it to death and I've got it in this dense, dark, thick body I call my flesh. Yeah. And that's, that's the tomb and the womb that it chose to come inside. And those two words in Greek are the same basic word, tomb, S-O-M-E, uh, tomb, womb, S-O-M-A, slave, S-O-M-E, same as that. And, and it's the same identical word, all you do is just change it in the vowel. That's all you do is change it in the vowel. So when you read the, the Greek New Testament that's talking about slaves, it's talking about a slave, you know what it's talking about? It's talking about your physical body. It's not talking about black folks. It's not talking about white folks. It's not talking about Chinese folks. It ain't talking about no folks. It's talking about your physical body. Your physical body is divine to be the slave of your spirit slash soul. It's divine to serve your spirit slash soul. How many of you have recognized we've got that backwards? <laughs> yes. Uh, just that old southern plain. I mean, backwards is the same word for backwards. <laughs> it's not a tobacco that you chew backward. <laughs> our, our, my slave is my physical body. That's what's supposed to be serving me. 
My tomb, my womb, is my physical body. And my soul, my spirit, chose to build my physical body so it could be a home in there, but it didn't build it so it could be a slave in its home. It built it so that it could resurrect, so that it could raise back up, it, so that it could awaken itself from the sleep, the stupor of the body, of the body temple. And it, it, it's not in there complaining. I mean, don't get me wrong. It doesn't complain. It doesn't holler out. It doesn't do anything. It's just patiently waiting. Waiting on what? Waiting on me to have an experience, an epiphany, a resurrection, a moment where I begin to rise up and allow that experience to transform my life and make that my life's purpose. Yeah. Hallelujah. So... Uh, I read that, I read that. And by the way, this little book I just read from here is Coombs' book called Christ Three Days in Hell. And when you read this little book, about 70 or 80 pages in this little book, I'm not sure, it's not, uh, it's not a big book, maybe 60 pages, it, it'll totally change your mind on your understanding of what hell is, Hades, and, you know, in the Greek. And it, it's, it talks about being the grave. The physical body is the grave. Okay, that's the grave of the spirit. And that's the place, that's the tomb. That's the place where the spirit slash soul comes to die, not as in die, as in extinction and or annihilation, but to lay as though it was immobile, as though it wasn't moving or it didn't have, it was like it was asleep. You know, when you lay down and go to sleep, it's like you're dead. If somebody was just looking at you and wasn't paying close attention, they said, I think he's dead. <laughs> Especially if he wasn't like me, snoring real good. You know, I said, oh dear God, he's much alive. <laughs> At least to it. But if you're not snoring, you're just laying there, you're just like you're dead. But you're not, you're just uh, asleep, okay? Right? Everybody everybody has that experience. So let me uh, go on. Go with me 1 Corinthians real quickly now. Uh, let me wind this down here. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And this is where, this chapter is where so much confusion is in the church today. And that's a result of probably the last several hundred years of what we would call evangelical preaching, where preachers get up and get all pumped up and trying to make everything literal, trying to get, it get you feeling really bad because you're just an old weird sinner, just done all these terrible, gross things. You know good and well you did, so you're guilty right out of start games. I mean, they got you. They got you right in good way. And you know, the only reason they got you because you don't know the truth. Anybody that knows truth, don't go on that mess and don't get to, don't feel so bad about what they did. Okay, First Corinthians chapter fifteen. Look at verse twelve. And I'm going to pick on several words that's in this translation that we that we could and we should change. It says, "And now, if Christ be preached that He rose, that's the Greek word agoro." And actually, the word really means to awake from sleep. That's what the word means. That he rose, or in other words, I would read, and if Christ be preached that he arose from the sleep, how say some among you that there is no resurrection? Now, that's a different word. That's anastasis. So you have two words here in the Greek, egero and anastasis. Egero means to arouse you from sleep. That's what the word means, period. That's what you do to your children. You remember when your children were in school? My girls were in school. They had to get up at a certain time. I would go in there you know, every morning around 7 or so, 1 o'clock, and I would say, you know, good morning, good morning, good morning. It's time to rise and shine. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Time to da da da. And I'd get them up that way. That's how I got them up, was through that song. And they, they to this day, they. Remember that very clearly. And so I was eggeroing. That's all I'm doing. Eggeroing. They weren't dead. They were asleep. And so that's what the word means. It, it means good morning, good morning, good morning. Time to rise, Jack. So it says that, uh, and there uh, rose from the dead, they rose from their sleep. How say some among you that there is no resurrection? That's anastasis. That just simply means to stand up from sleep. That's all it means, stand up from sleep. So one of them means to awaken because you are asleep, and the other one means to stand up now that you're awake. 
It would be ridiculous if I told them, if I went there and told them to wake up and they just wake up, they just lay there all the day in the bed and not get up, not get about doing their thing. Now those two words, resurrection, that means to stand up from your sleep, from your night's stupor. It means to stand up. It ain't got nothing to do with being in a coffin. It ain't got nothing to do with the air leaving your body and you being completely annihilated and already rotted. It ain't got nothing to do with that. I mean, that's where we have allowed knowledge and wisdom to go completely outside and thinking that somehow or another or some great miracle for some mystery reason, God's going to put flesh back over your physical body after it died and rotted and, or even give you the bones. <laughs> Ignorance is going to see. But we get that way, don't we? <laughs> yeah, we do. We do. All right, so he says that... Uh, I'll say some among you that there is no anastasis or no standing up after sleep. If there is no standing up after sleep, then is Christ not risen? And the answer would be, well, no, because what we're referring to now is that dying and resurrected God, man, it's inside. You are asleep within the boat of your being. If he's asleep in the boat of your body, what do you want to do? You want to aggro him. You want to stir him up. You want to anastasis him. Not only wake up, we want you to get up. <laughs> It's a storm coming out of here. Don't you care that we perish? Well, he said, well, what do you go out there and talk to it yourself. I don't want to. I want you to do it. <laughs> Would you come back and talk to it for me? Oh, my, 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 my. Look at verse 20. And now is Christ risen from the dead. In other words, he's awakening. He's awakening. This is what the resurrection of the God-man is all about. That's exactly what when we put this signal to cross up here this universal signal and the sun is coming up you see these four designations golly bug yod hey vav hey there are so many designations this is morning m o r n i n g this is spring s p r i n g this is uh, afternoon a f t e r n o n uh, summer, S-U-M-M-E-R. This is uh, fall, F-A-L-L. -L. Autumn, mm. evening. And this is night. N-I-G-H-T. Da, 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 da. So you have spring, summer, evening, and night. You have morning, afternoon, uh, evening, and I, I mean, you, you see that uh, this this cross and everything on this cross, everything about this mythology, you're the one hanging on this cross. This cross is about humanity that's taken on physical flesh, and then what entered into here was the was the eternal, can't die, the timeless spirit slash soul. And it comes into the physical body and it's hung on this physical body as though it were in a comatose state. And Paul's writings are constantly about the awakening of this energy of God to transform and to change my life. And it does it initially from an experience that I have. That's generally what kickstarts it. You can have that experience at any age you want to. I think I had my first initial experience around the age of 8, 9, or 10. So I was just a kid. I had already gone through those first seven years of my nurturing where I had, I had downloaded all of this stuff inside me, but now I'm out here and I'm having this experience. And this experience was that divine awakening starting to take place at a young age. And then you know what? I looked around at all the church stuff after several years from probably around the age 9 or 10 to go around the age 12 or 13. I said, this bunch of bull. This don't even measure up at all. I'm a man now, bless God. I'm taller than my daddy. <laughs> I can do it myself. <laughs> yeah, so I walked away. Well, you know, when I'm in my mid-20s and I'm in a really tight spot in my life, my life is falling all apart. I have this phenomenal experience of awakening. I wasn't in tears. I wasn't sorry about everything I did. I come to this experience. I need help. God is an ever-present help in time. I, I, I was there. I needed it. 
I had that experience. Every one of us have had this. And these, this experience is not one that I had back there and I'm leaving back there. I'm having it right now. I'm having that experience. Why? I'm, I'm that energy, that oil, anointing, that oil, that spirit is moving inside me. It's raising me up. It's showing me that I have this divine ability. I have this power inside my being. I am this power. So verse 20 he says, And now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For as since by man came sleep, death, or sleep, by man also comes the awakening from sleep, from death. Did you get that? Did you hear that? You the one who went to sleep. How did we do that? Well, first seven years of nursery began to mesmerize me, began to it put so much on me that it began to I began to overshroud this. That, you know how you were, y'all remember how you were when you were two and three and four. You remember you had these imaginary characters? Do y'all remember that? You had to. You know, like a little boy, I'm four years old, I got a broomstick, buddy. I'm riding a horse. You couldn't change that. That was, bless God, that broomstick was a horse. You know, I built me a little boxcar derby. You couldn't change it. I was Fireball Roberts. I was racing that big Pontiac. You couldn't change it because, y'all know, the mind of a child is that way. He goes into those wires. He's still in tune to that that's eternal inside him. He's still in tune to the divine essence. It takes us six or seven years through the shrouding of the physical body growing to lull to, to that to sleep. Yep. And then, what does it wait? It's waiting this resurrection. It's waiting this time of my experience that I can begin to see. So verse 22 it says, As in Adam all die, even so in Christ are all made to live. Adam just simply means the physical body, and in the physical body I have a I have wounds of sleep that Christ consciousness. Uh, look, in, look in this same book, I mean same chapter, same chapter, uh, over to, uh, well, let's just read verse 40. Let's read all this and we'll walk. We had it all closed right here. Uh, read. Let me read this real quick. We'll just run through this. Verse 40 says, There are also celestial, that celestial is another word for astrological, or heavenly bodies and bodies terrestrial that's earthly or natural but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another one glory of the sun another of the moon and you know we talked last week we talked before that about the sun and the moon and how they play such a vital part in the resurrection story and they are just symbols that we have in the sky of the very things that's happening inside us of spirit and soul. Sun is represented by spirit, soul represented by the moon. And these two characters are what the whole Easter story are built on. The sun and the moon. The death and the resurrection. So, he's, he goes on, he says, verse 41, one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, one star differs from another star in glory, so also is the resurrection. There's that word again, anastasis, or standing up from sleep. It is sown in corruption, it is raised, that's that word agero, which means awakened in, in corruption. It is sown in dishonor, it's in, and here again, you hear these words back and forth, raised in glory and ain't got nothing to do with raising a physical body up out of a grave. Ain't got anything to do with it. That's what they did to this passage of scripture with these two words. Egero and Anastasis. Wake up stand up. That's all they're referring to. Wake up and stand up. It's Verse 43, it's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown in a natural body. It's raised, it's, it's raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body. There is a spiritual body. And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterwards that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth earthy. The second is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. As we have bore our that word bore just simply means to wear like clothing. See, like this morning I bore this, is this shirt blue or green? I want to see if y'all right or left or brain. <laughs> 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 this 
morning I, I'm wearing this blue shirt. Uh, hallelujah. That's what that word means. Bore means to wear as we wear the image of the earthly. I mean, that's exactly what, you look this up in the Greek. I double dog there. Look it up in the Greek and see what it said. I guarantee you, you'll see that the word right here is for ao, and the word for ao simply means to wear clothes. You wear your body just like you wear your clothes. Same identical thing. But look at it. As we have borne the image of the earthly, King James says, we shall also, in the Greek it don't say we shall, in the Greek it says let us, U.S. There's that us again. All of them other us is this. There it says, let us also wear the image of the heavenly. Just like you're wearing the image of the physical, he said, now that it's time to stand up, it's time now to wake up and stand up and experience your resurrection and wear the image of the spiritual, the divine, that God that's inside you. And that's the... And that's the commission to all of humanity. And not only is it the commission, it's a choice that you make individually. Nobody can make this for you. If we can ever get that truth, if we can ever begin to own that, I'm responsible for me and no other. I mean, I have other people around me that I want to be responsible for, but all them around me that I want to be responsible for, they won't do what I try to tell them to do, bless God. <laughs> My children, my grandchildren, and all the all of my other spiritual children, bless God, I'm just gonna give every damn one of them a good spanking, you know, because they don't they don't do what I tell them. Well, I need to shake myself from that. Do you hear what the worry, the anxiety, the stress that we put on ourselves for no reason? We have to shake ourselves from that. So let me read this. This is an outstanding little book, and it's by Coon again. It's called Easter, the Birthday of the Gods. It's mm. just an outstanding book. Some of this may be hard to get from Kuhn. But anyway, this is what he says in Kuhn. He says, For that which died on the cross of matter was no single individual man, but the divine nucleus of soul apportioned among all men. It was sent forth by the Heavenly Father to be the spiritual grain of wheat planted in the ground of human flesh. Therein to lie long in inertness and death until resurrected by the rebirth of its dormant powers in the springtime turn of the cycle. And this distortion of the message of the Good Friday and the Easter ritual into the commemoration of a crucifixion and resurrection of one human body has destroyed as Jung, he's talking about Carl Jung, now he's quoting Carl Jung, one of the most eminent psychiatrists, psychologists of the last hundreds, hundred years ago. As Jung so forthrightly insists, the enlightening and the impelling power of the dramatized reality. And I wrote this little note here under that from something that Kuhn said. He says, in the case of the individual man, the body is the organic vehicle of the soul's manifestation and the soul's life in body. So I wrote this. Spirit slash soul both are eternal yet have very different functions. This is mostly not understood. In other words, the spirit is all powerful and timeless, yet can be in time. The spirit is non judgmental and merciful, is filled with goodness, and is overflowing with love. It, the, the spirit, the God spirit, is the universal source. It cannot judge, it will not condemn, even if it tries. It's the spirit that is the representative of the sun. It is the soul that is the representative of the moon. The soul waxing and waning is just like the ego or slash soul in its good day or bad day. Both are eternal gifts given to the human being by the source of God itself. Hallelujah. To be continued. <laughs>